Chapter 50 Theon One moment he was asleep, the next awake. Kira nestled against him, one arm draped lightly over his, her breasts brushing his back. He could hear her breathing, soft and steady. The sheet was tangled about them. It was the black of night. The bedchamber was dark and still. What is it? Did I hear something? Someone? Wind sighed faintly against the shutters. Somewhere far off, he heard the yowl of a cat in heat. Nothing else. Sleep, Greyjoy, he told himself. The castle is quiet, and you have guards posted. At your door, at the gates, on the armory. He might have put it down to a bad dream, but he did not remember dreaming. Kira had worn him out. Until Theon had sent for her, she had lived all of her eighteen years in the winter town without ever setting foot inside the walls of the castle. She came to him wet and eager and lithe as a weasel, and there had been a certain undeniable spice to fucking a common tavern wench in Lord Eddard Stark's own bed. She murmured sleepily as Theon slid out under her, from under her arm and got to his feet. A few embers still smoldered in the hearth. Weck slept on the floor at the foot of the bed rolled up inside his cloak and dead to the world. Nothing moved. Theon crossed to the window and threw open the shutters. Night touched him with cold fingers, and goose prickles rose on his bare skin. He leaned against the stone sill and looked out on dark towers, empty yards, black sky, and more stars than a man could ever count if he lived to be a hundred. A half-moon floated above the bell tower and cast its reflection on the roof of the glass gardens. He heard no alarms, no voices, not so much as a footfall. All's well, Greyjoy. You're the quiet? You ought to be drunk with joy. You took Winterfell with fewer than thirty men, a feat to sing of. Theon started back to bed. He'd roll Kira on her back and fuck her again. That ought to banish these phantoms. Her gasps and giggles would make a welcome respite from this silence. He stopped. He had grown so used to the howling of the dire wolves that he scarcely heard it any more. But some part of him, some hunter's instinct, heard its absence. Urzen stood outside his door, a sinewy man with a round shield slung over his back. The wolves are quiet, Theon told him. Go see what they're doing and come straight back. The thought of the dire wolves running loose gave him a queasy feeling. He remembered the day in the wolf's wood when the wildlings had attacked Bran. Summer and grey wind had torn them to pieces. When he prodded Wex with the toe of his boot, the boy sat up and rubbed his eyes. Make certain Bran Stark and his little brother are in their beds, and be quick about it. My lord? Kira called sleepily. Go back to sleep. This does not concern you. Theon poured himself a cup of wine and drank it down. All the time he was listening hoping to hear a howl. Too few men, he thought sourly. I have too few men. If Ashen does not come... Wex returned the quickest, shaking his head side to side. Cursing, Theon found his tunic and breeches on the floor where he had dropped them in his haste to get at Kira. Over the tunic he donned a jerkin of iron-studded leather, and he belted a long sword and dagger at his waist. His hair was wild as the wood, but he had larger concerns. By then, Urzen was back. The wolves be gone. Theon told himself if he must be as cold. Theon told himself he must be as cold and deliberate as Lord Eddard. Rouse the castle, he said. Herd them out into the yard. Everyone will see who's missing, and have Lauren make a round of the gates. Wex with me. He wondered if Stig had reached Deepwood Mott yet. The man was not as skilled a rider as he had claimed. None of the Iron Men were much good in the saddle, but there'd been time enough. Asha might well be on her way. And if she learns that I have lost the Starks, it did not bear thinking about. Bran's bedchamber was empty, as was Rickon's half a turn below. Theon cursed himself. He should have kept a guard on them, but he deemed it more important to have men walking the walls and protecting the gates than to nursemaid a couple of children, one a cripple. Outside, he heard sobbing as the castle folk were pulled from their beds and driven into the yard. I'll give them a reason to sob. I've used them gently, and this is how they repay me. 
He'd even had two of his own men whipped bloody for raping that kennel girl, to show them he meant to be just. They still blame me for the rape, though. And the rest. He deemed that unfair. Meekin had killed himself with his mouth, just as Benford had. As for Chael, well, he had to give someone to the drowned god. His men expected it. I bear you no ill will, he told the septon before they threw him down the well. But you and your gods have no place here now. You'd think the others might be grateful he hadn't chosen one of them. But no. He wondered how many of them were part of this plot against him. Urzen returned with Black Lauren. The Hunter's Gate, Lauren said. Best come see. The Hunter's Gate was conveniently sited close to the kennels and kitchens. It opened directly on fields and forests, allowing riders to come and go without first passing through the winter town, and so was favored by hunting parties. Who had the guard here? Theon demanded. Drennan and Squint. Drennan was one of the men who'd raped Paula. If they've let those boys escape, I'll have more than a little skin off their back this time, I swear it. No need for that, Black Lauren said curtly. Nor was there. They found Squint floating face down in the moat, his entrails drifting behind him like a nest of pale snakes. Drennan lay half-naked in the gatehouse, in the snug room where the drawbridge was worked. His throat had been opened ear to ear. A ragged tunic concealed the half-healed scars on his back, but his boots were scattered amidst the rushes, and his breeches tangled about his feet. There was cheese on a small table near the door, beside an empty flagon, and two cups. Theon picked one up and sniffed at the dregs of wine in the bottom. Squint was up on the wall walk, no? Aye, said Lauren. Theon flung the cup into the hearth. I'd say Drennan was pulling down his breeches to stick it in the woman when she stuck it in him. It was on cheese knife by the look of it. Someone find a pike and fish the other fool out of the moat. The other fool was in a deal worse shape than Drennan. When Black Lauren drew him out of the water, they saw that one of his arms had been wrenched off at the elbow, half his neck was missing, and there was a ragged hole where his navel and groin once had been. The pike tore through his bowels as Lauren was pulling him in. The stench was awful. The dire wolves, Theon said. Both of them at a guess. Disgusted, he walked back to the drawbridge. Winterfell was encircled by two massive granite walls, with a wide moat between them. The outer wall stood eighty feet high, the inner more than a hundred. Lacking men, Theon had been forced to abandon the outer defenses and post his guards along the higher inner walls. He dared not risk having them on the wrong side of the moat should the castle rise against him. There had to be two or more, he decided. While the woman was entertaining, the others freed the wolves. Theon called for a torch and led them up the steps to the wall walk. He swept the flame low before him, looking for... There, on the inside of the rampart and in the wide crenel between two upthrust merlins. Blood, he announced. Clumsily mopped up. At a guess, the woman killed Drennan and lowered the drawbridge. Squint heard the clank of chains, came to have a look, and got this far. They pushed the corpse through the crenel into the moat so he wouldn't be found by another sentry. Urzen peered along the walls. The other watch turrets be not far. I see torches burning. Torches, but no guards, Theon said testily. Winterfell has more turrets than I have men. Four guards at the main gate, said Black Lauren, and five walking the walls beside Squint. Urzen said, If he had sounded his horn, I am served by fools. Try and imagine it was you up there, Urzen. It's dark and cold. You've been walking sentry for hours, looking forward to the end of your watch. Then you hear a noise and move toward the gate. And suddenly you see eyes at the top of the stair, glowing green and gold in the torchlight. Two shadows come rushing towards you faster than you can believe. You catch a glimpse of teeth, start to level your spear, and they slam into you and open your belly, tearing through leather as if it were cheesecloth. He gave Urzen a hard shove. And now you're down on your back. Your guts are spilling out, and one of them has his teeth around your neck. Theon grabbed the man's scrawny throat, tightened his fingers, and smiled. Tell me, 
At what moment during all of this do you stop to blow your fucking whore? He shoved Erzin away roughly, sending him stumbling back against a Merlin. The man rubbed his throat. I should have had those beasts put down the day we took the castle, he thought angrily. I'd seen them kill. I knew how dangerous they were. We must go after them, Black Lorne said. Not in the dark. Theon did not relish the idea of chasing direwolves through the wood by night. The hunters could easily become the hunted. We'll wait for daylight. Until then, I'd best go speak with my loyal subjects. Down in the yard, an uneasy crowd of men, women, and children had been pushed up against the wall. Many had not been given time to dress. They covered themselves with woolen blankets, or huddled naked under cloaks or bedrobes. A dozen iron men hemmed them in, torches in one hand and weapons in the other. The wind was gusting, and the flickering orange light reflected dully off steel helms, thick beards, and unsmiling eyes. Theon walked up and down before the prisoners, studying the faces. They all looked guilty to him. How many are missing? Six. Reek stepped up behind him, smelling of soap, his long hair moving in the wind. Both Starks, that bog boy and his sister, the half-wit from the stables, and your wildling woman, Osha. He had suspected her from the moment he saw that second cop. I should have known better than to trust that one. She's as unnatural as Asha. Even their names sound alike. Has anyone had a look at the stables? Agar says no horses are missing. Dancer is still in his stall? Dancer? Reek frowned. Agar says the horses are all there. Only the half-wit is missing. They're afoot, then. That was the best news he'd heard since he woke. Brand would be riding in his basket on Hodor's back, no doubt. Osha would need to carry Rickon. His little legs wouldn't take him far on their own. Theon was confident that he'd soon have them back in his hands. Bran and Rickon have fled, he told the castle folk, watching their eyes. Who knows where they've gone? No one answered. They could not have escaped without help, Theon went on. Without food, clothing, weapons. He had locked away every sword and axe in Winterfell, but no doubt some had been hidden from him. I'll have the names of all those who aided them, all those who turned a blind eye. The only sound was the wind. Come first light, I mean to bring them back. He hooked his thumbs through his sword, sword belt. I need huntsmen. Who wants a nice warm wolf skin to see them through the winter? Gage? The cook had always greeted him cheerfully when he returned from the hunt to ask whether he'd brought anything choice for the table. But he had nothing to say now. Theon walked back the way he had come, searching the faces for the least sign of guilty knowledge. The wild is no place for a cripple, and Rickon, young as he is, how long will he last out there? Nan, think how frightened he must be. The old woman had nattered at him for ten years, telling her endless stories, but now she gaped at him as if he were some stranger. I might have killed every man of you and given your women to my soldiers for their pleasure, but instead I protected you. Is this the thanks you offer? Joseph, who'd groomed his horse, Farlan, who'd taught him all he knew of hounds, Barth, the brewer's wife, who'd been his first. Not one of them would meet his eyes. They hate me, he realized. Reek stepped close. Strip off their skins, he urged, his thick lips glistening. Lord Bolton, he used to say a naked man has few secrets. But a flayed man's got none. The flayed man was the sigil of House Bolton, Theon knew. Ages past, certain of their lords had gone so far as to cloak themselves in the skins of dead enemies. A number of Starks had ended thus. Supposedly all that had stopped a thousand years ago, when the Boltons had bent their knees to Winterfell. Or so they say. But old ways die hard, as well I know. There will be no flaying in the north so long as I rule in Winterfell, Theon said loudly. I am your only protection against the likes of him, he wanted to scream. He could not be that blatant. 
but perhaps some were clever enough to take the lesson. The sky was graying over the castle walls. Dawn could not be far off. Joseph, saddle Smiler and a horse for yourself. Merch, Garrus, Poxy, Tim, you'll come as well. Merch and Garrus were the best huntsmen in the castle, and Tim was a fine bowman. Agar, Rednose, Gelmar, Reek, Wex. He needed his own to watch his back. Farlin, I want hounds, and you to handle them. The grizzled kennel master crossed his arms. And why should I care to hunt down my own true-born lords and babes at that? Theon moved close. I am your true-born lord now, and the man who keeps Paula safe. He saw the defiance die in Farland's eyes. Aye, my lord. Stepping back, Theon glanced about to see who else he might add. Maester Lewin, he announced. I know nothing of hunting. No, but I don't trust you in the castle in my absence. Then it's past time you learned. Let me come too. I want that wolfskin cloak. A boy stepped forward, no older than Bran. It took Theon a moment to remember him. I've hunted lots of times before, Walder Frey said. Red deer and elk, and even boar. His cousin laughed at him. He rode in the boar hunt with his father, but they never let him near the boar. Theon looked at the boy doubtfully. Come if you like, but if you can't keep up, don't think that I'll nurse you along. He turned back to Black Lauren. Winterfell is yours in my absence. If we do not return... Do with it as you will. That bloody well ought to have them praying for my success. They assembled by the hunter's gate as the first pale rays of the sun brushed the top of the bell tower, their breath frosting in the cold morning air. Gelmar had equipped himself with a long axe whose reach would allow him to strike before the wolves were on him. The blade was heavy enough to kill with a single blow. Agar wore steel greaves. Reek arrived carrying a boar spear and an overstuffed washerwoman's sack bulging with God's new what. Theon had his bow. He needed nothing else. Once he had saved Bran's life with an arrow. He hoped he would not need to take it with another. But if it came to that, he would. Eleven men, two boys, and a dozen dogs crossed the moat. Beyond the outer wall, the tracks were plain to read in the soft ground. The paw prints of the wolves... Hodor's heavy tread, the shallower marks left by the feet of the last two reed of the two reeds. Once under the trees, the stony ground and fallen leaves made the trails harder to see, but by then Farland's red bitch had the scent. The rest of the dogs were close behind, the hounds sniffing and barking, a pair of monstrous mastiffs bringing up the rear. Their size and ferocity might make the difference against a cornered direwolf. He'd have guessed that Osha might run south to Sir Roderick, but the trail led north by northwest, into the very heart of the wolf's wood. Theon did not like that one bit. It would be a bitter irony if the Starks made for Deepwood Mott and delivered themselves right into Asha's hands. I'd sooner have them dead, he thought bitterly. It's better to be seen as cruel than foolish. Wisps of pale mist threaded between the trees. Sentinels and soldier pines grew thick about here and there was nothing as dark and gloomy as an evergreen forest. The ground was uneven, and the fallen needles disguised the softness of the turf and made the footing treacherous for the horses, so they had to go slowly. Not as slowly as a man carrying a cripple, though, or a bony harridan with a four-year-old on her back. He told himself to be patient. He'd have them before the day was out. Maester Lewin trotted up to him as they were following a game trail along the lip of a ravine. Thus far, hunting seems indistinguishable from riding through the woods, my lord. Theon smiled. There are similarities, but with hunting, there's blood at the end. Must it be so? This flight was great folly, but will you not be merciful? These are your foster brothers we seek. No Stark but Rob was ever brotherly toward me. But Bran and Rickon have more value to me living than dead. The same is true of the reeds. Moat Caelan sits on the edge of the bogs. Lord Howland can make your uncle's occupation a visit to hell if he chooses. But so long as you hold his heirs, he must stay his hand. Theon had not considered that. In truth, he had scarcely considered the mud men at all. 
beyond eyeing Mira once or twice and wondering if she was still a maiden. You may be right. We will spare them if we can. And Hodor, too, I hope. The boy is simple, you know that. He does as he is told. How many times has he groomed your horse, soaked your saddle, scoured your mail? Hodor was nothing to him. If he does not fight us, we will let him live. Theon pointed a finger. But say one word about sparing the wildling, and you can die with her. She swore me an oath and pissed on it. The maester inclined his head. I make no apologies for oath-breakers. Do what you must. I thank you for your mercy. Mercy, thought Theon as Lewin dropped back. There's a bloody trap. Too much and they call you weak. Too little and you're monstrous. Yet the maester had given him good counsel, he knew. His father thought only in terms of conquest, but what good was it to take a kingdom if you could not hold it? Force and fear could carry you only so far. A pity Ned Stark had taken his daughters south. Elsewise, Theon could have tightened his grip on Winterfell by marrying one of them. Sansa was a pretty little thing, too, and by now likely even ripe for betting. But she was a thousand leagues away, in the clutches of the Lannisters. A shame. The wood grew ever wilder. The pines and sentinels gave way to huge dark oaks. Tangles of hawthorn concealed treacherous gullies and cuts. Stony hills rose and fell. They passed a crofter's cottage, deserted and overgrown, and skirted a flooded quarry where the still water had a sheen as gray as steel. When the dogs began to bay, Theon figured the fugitives were near at hand. He spurred Smiler and followed at a trot, but what he found was only the carcass of a young elk, or what remained of it. He dismounted for a closer look. The kill was still fresh, and plainly the work of wolves. The dogs sniffed around it eagerly and one of the mastiffs buried his teeth in a haunch until Farland shouted him off. No part of this animal has been butchered, Theon realized. The wolves ate, but not the men. Even if Osha did not want to risk a fire, she ought to have cut them a few steaks. It made no sense to leave so much good meat to rot. Farlin, are you certain we're on the right trail? he demanded. Could your dogs be chasing the wrong wolves? My bitch knows the smell of summer and shaggy well enough. I hope so, for your sake. Less than an hour later, the trail led down a slope toward a muddy brook swollen by the recent rains. It was there the dogs lost the scent. Farlin and Wax waded across with the hounds and came back shaking their heads while the animals ranged up and down the far bank, sniffing. They went in here, my lord, but I can't see where they came out, the kennel master said. Theon dismounted and knelt beside the stream. He dipped a hand in it. The water was cold. They won't have stayed long in this, he said. Take half the dogs downstream. I'll go up. Wex clapped his hands together loudly. What is it? Theon said. The mute boy pointed. The ground near the water was sodden and muddy. The tracks the wolves had left were plain enough. Paw prints, yes, so... Wex drove his heel into the mud and pivoted his foot this way and that. It left a deep gouge. Joseph understood. Man the size of Hodor ought to have left a deep print in this mud, he said, more so with the weight of a boy on his back. If the only boot prints here are our own, see for yourself. Appalled, Theon saw it was true. The wolves had gone into the turgid brown water alone. Osha must have turned aside back of us, before the elk, most likely. She sent the wolves on by her themselves, hoping we'd chase after them. He rounded on his huntsmen. If you two have played me false... There's been only one trail, my lord, I swear it, said Garrus defensively. And the dire wolves would never have parted from them boys, not for long. That's so, Theon thought. Summer and Shaggy Dog might have gone off to hunt but sooner or late they would return to Bran and Rickon. Garrus, Murch, take four dogs and double back. Find where we lost them. Agar, you watch them. I'll have no trickery. Farlin and I will follow the dire wolves. Give a blast on the horn when you pick up the trail. Two blasts if you catch sight of the beasts themselves. Once we find where they went, they'll lead us back to their masters. 
He took Wax, the fray boy, and Giner, Red Nose, to search upstream. He and Wax rode on one side of the brook, Red Nose and Walder Frey on the other, each with a pair of hounds. The wolves might have come out on either bank. Theon kept an eye out for tracks, spoor, broken branches, any hint as to where the dire wolves might have left the water. He spied the prints of deer, elk, and badger easily enough. Wex surprised a vixen drinking at the stream, and Walder flushed three rabbits from the underbrush and managed to put an arrow in one. They saw the claw marks where a bear had shedded the bark of a tall birch. But of the dire wolves there was no sign. A little farther, Theon told himself. Past that oak, over that rise, past the next be- bend of the stream, we'll find something there. He pressed on long after he knew he should turn back, a growing sense of anxiety gnawing at his belly. It was midday when he wrenched Smiler's head round in disgust and gave up. Somehow, Osha and the wretched boys were eluding him. It, could not, it should not have been possible. Not on foot, burdened with a cripple and a young child. Every passing hour increased the likelihood that they would make good their escape. If they reach a village, the people of the north would never deny Ned Stark's sons, Rob's brothers. They'd have mounts to speed them on their way, food. Men would fight for the honor of protecting them. The whole bloody north would rally around them. The wolves went downstream, that's all. He clung to that thought. That red bitch will sniff where they came out of the water and will be after them again. But when they joined up with Farland's party, one look at the kennel master's face smashed all of Theon's hopes to shards. The only thing those dogs are fit for is a bear baiting, he said angrily. Would that I had a bear. The dogs are not at fault. Farland knelt between a mastiff and his precious red bitch, a hand on each. Running water don't hold no sense, my lord. The wolves had to come out of the stream somewhere. No doubt they did. Upstream or down. We keep on, we'll find the place. But which way? I never knew a wolf to run up a stream bed for miles, said Reek. A man might. If he knew he was being hunted, he might. But a wolf? Yet Theon wondered. These beasts were not as other wolves. I should have skinned the cursed things. It was the same tale all over again when they rejoined Garrus, Murch, and Agar. The huntsmen had retraced their steps halfway to Winterfell without finding any sign of where the Starks might have parted company with the dire wolves. Farland's hounds seemed as frustrated as their masters, sniffing forlornly at trees and rocks and snapping irritably at each other. Theon dared not admit defeat. We'll return to the brook. Search again. This time we'll go as far as we must. We won't find them, the fray boy said suddenly. Not so long as the frog eaters are with them. Mud men are sneaks. They won't fight like decent folks. They skulk and use poison arrows. You never see them, but they see you. Those who go into the bogs after them get lost and never come out. Their houses move. Even the castles like Greywater watch. He glanced nervously at greenery that encircled them on all sides. They might be out here right now. Listening to everything we say. Farland laughed to show what he thought of that notion. My dogs would smell anything in them bushes. Be all over them before you could break wind, boy. Frog eaters don't smell like men, Frey insisted. They have a boggy stink, like frogs and trees and scummy water. Moss grows under their arms in place of hair, and they can live with nothing to eat but mud and breathe swamp water. Theon was about to tell him what he ought to do with his wet nurse's fable when Maester Lewin spoke up. The histories say the Cranog men grew close to the children of the forest in the days when the Greenseers tried to bring the hammer of the waters down upon the neck. It may be that they have secret knowledge. Suddenly, the wood seemed a deal darker than it had a moment before, as if a cloud had passed before the sun. It was one thing to have some fool boy spouting folly, but maesters were supposed to be wise. The only children that concern me are Bran and Rickon, Theon said. Back to the stream. Now! For a moment, he did not think they were going to obey, but in the end, old habit asserted itself. They followed sullenly, but they followed. The fray boy was as jumpy as those rabbits he'd flushed earlier. 
Theon put men on either bank and followed the current. They rode for miles, going slow and careful, dismounting to lead the horses over the treacherous ground, letting the good for bear bait hounds sniff at every bush. Where a fallen tree dammed the flow, the hunters were forced to loop around a deep green pool. But if the direwolves had done the same, they'd left neither print nor spore. The beasts had taken to swimming, it seemed. When I catch them, they'll have all the swimming they can stomach. I'll give them both to the drowned god. When the woods began to darken, Theon Greyjoy knew he was beaten. Either the Cranog men did know the magic of the children of the forest, or else Osha had deceived them with some wildling trick. He made them press on through the dusk. But when the last light faded, Joseph finally worked up the courage to say, This is fruitless, my lord. We will lame a horse, break a leg. Joseph has the right of it, said Maester Lewin. Groping through the woods by torchlight will avail us nothing. Theon could taste bile at the back of his throat, and his stomach was a nest of snakes twinning and snapping at each other. If he crept back to Winterfell empty-handed... He might as well dress in motley henceforth and wear a pointed hat. The whole north would know him for a fool. And when my father hears, and Asha, my lord prince, Reek urged his horse near, might be them Starks never came this way. If I was them, I would have gone north and east, maybe, to the Humbers. Good Stark men they are, but their lands are a long way. The boys will shelter some place nearer. Might be I know where. Theon looked at him suspiciously. Tell me. You know that old mill, sitting lonely on the acorn water? We stopped there when I was being dragged to Winterfell a captive. The miller's wife sold us hay for our horses while that old knight clopped over her brats. Might be the Starks is hiding there. Theon knew the mill. He'd even tumbled the miller's wife a time or two. There was nothing special about it, or her. Why there? There are a dozen villages in Holdfast just as close. Amusement shone in those pale eyes. Why? No, that's past knowing. But they're there. I have a feeling. He was growing sick of the man's sly answers. His lips looked like two worms fucking... What are you saying? If you've kept some knowledge from me, my lord prince... Reek dismounted and beckoned Theon to do the same. When they were both afoot, he pulled open the cloth sack he'd fetched from Winterfell. Have a look here. It was growing hard to see. Theon thrust his hand into the sack impatiently, groping among soft fur and rough scratchy wool. A sharp point pricked his skin, and his fingers closed around something cold and hard. He drew out a wolf's head brooch, silver and jet. Understanding came suddenly. His hand closed into a fist. Gelmar, he said, wondering whom he could trust. None of them. Agar, Red Nose, with us. The rest of you may return to Winterfell with the hounds. I'll have no further need of them. I know where Bran and Rickon are hiding now. Prince Theon, Maester Lewin entreated. You will remember your promise. Mercy, you said. Mercy was for this morning, said Theon. It is better to be feared than laughed at. Before they made me angry, 